Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church this morning. Whether you are listening on the radio uh, with us as a, a part of a live stream or of course a welcome to those of you who are here in person. What a difference one week can make. Last Sunday morning in this sanctuary or outside it was gloomy and cold and damp and it felt dark in here. Uh, today it is uh, sunny and clear. I had a visitor at my house uh, late last night, I guess. It was Jack Frost. And uh, perhaps some of you, uh, if you went out like I did to get your morning paper uh, this morning, uh, just enjoy the silvery sheen on the pine straw and the, and the grass and the uh, sharp crispness in the air. Uh, we pray for that kind of energy in our church this morning. Uh, let God's Spirit move through everything that happens in this service of worship. If you've not already done so, fill out the uh, registration of attendance pads and uh, let us know that you're here. And we are just so glad to be in the house of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer.
remain standing as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The children will come down front. I'll figure this out. Sorry about that. Good morning, boys. Where are the girls? Where are, where are they? None. Oh, no, we'll have to do something about that. Well, I am glad you guys are here. And um, who was here at the very beginning of the, of the service? All of y'all were, right? Did y'all see Reverend Creed get up and, and talk to everybody? He was making some announcements. He was welcoming folks. Did y'all see that? Do y'all ever have announcements at school? Do, you, do they ever get on the speakers and, and broadcast through Springdale and through Stratford maybe where y'all go to school? Let me show you a few things. I'm going to get down here with you guys so you can tell me. Y'all pass those around for me. And then just hold on to it. Do y'all see this? You see this? This is a mag, a local school magazine where they're announcing what? Can y'all see? What are these pictures of, Thomas? Babies. And then look at this particular baby. Let's see if I can find him. Do you know who number 18 is? Baxter, see if you recognize him. Who's that chubby little soon to be redheaded baby? That's you. That's where we announced. <laughs> Baxter, class of 98, and Christy James, welcome to new son, Baxter James III. And then on the next page, what are those people doing, Sherwood? Having a wedding. Having a wedding. A lot of people got married that were graduates, alumni of Stratford in this particular case. What does your, do you know what yours says? Can you read what that says? It says, please join us to celebrate the baptism of our son. What's his name? William Sherwood on August 14th. And then, Graham, what does this one say? Charles Baxter James III. It says, we with great joy and gratitude announce Charles Baxter James III in February of 2014. So what are all of these things doing? What do you think they're doing? They, they are um, seeing what they are doing. They 
are. They're making announcements about things that are going on and things that are happening. Does anybody else want to read theirs? We have some birthday invitations. We have another baptism. What's this one? Oh, this is Sherwood when he turned one and had no teeth. These are all ways of, form, of making announcements of important news to people, just like Creed made an announcement to all of us. We're going to learn in our lesson and during our gospel lesson from um, Pastor Tripp about Jesus went to make an announcement, but in his day... Um, during his day, they didn't have these fancy magazines. They didn't have um, announcements. Sure, but come have a seat. He had to do it in the middle of his synagogue, and he made an announcement about a very important one about how he was sent to fulfill the law of the Old Testament. So let's all say a quick prayer together as we are thankful for this message, okay? Close your eyes. Hands to yourself. Y'all too. All right, y'all repeat after me, okay? Dear Lord, thank you so much for your announcement of Jesus Christ who came and has been the Savior for us all. Lord, we are thankful for the news of your Son and for our salvation through him. Let us all announce this wonderful news out in the world this week. Amen. All right, y'all may go with Miss Julia Magda to Children's Church. Have fun. Today's Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Nehemiah. Hear now the word of God. All the people gathered together in the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the meaning so that people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength.
Let me invite you to stand as you are able for the reading from the gospel. Luke's gospel with the 14th chapter, excuse me, the fourth chapter beginning with the 14th verse. And I invite you to listen for God's word. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Luke tells this story somewhat as Jesus' first sermon back in his hometown. Most of us preachers have stories about those early sermons. Uh, more than one sir, more than one story uh, frequently. Uh, my, my favorite story doesn't come from the days, you know, like youth services when the MYF was uh, called upon uh, for an evening service or the college students home for Christmas vacation were called on for, to lead a uh, watch night service. But it goes back to the summer of 1971. I had finished one year of theology school at, at Emory. I had been to annual conference, had been elected a member on probation, and uh, had been ordained a deacon. Uh, V.L. Daughtry was pastor of our home church, and we were working uh, for there for the summer, and V.L. entrusted us each with a, uh, with a, a Sunday morning service. It was a big deal. Uh, I, you know, you, you stand up there and hear, uh, the, hear uh, you look out at the people who remember how you misbehaved in the balcony when you were a junior high, uh, those who taught you Sunday school when you were a kid, those who invested their Sunday evenings with you as an MYF counselor, uh, your mother and dad's friends and, and all the like. Jan and I were engaged to be married later that summer, so it was such a big deal that here uh, she came down from Atlanta for that. And we, we got up and the time came and I, I got up to preach. Don't expect too much of the story. It's not like the roof fell in or something like that. But, but I, I stood up to preach. I had prepared my remarks. I had on my new black robe and the red stole that my mother had made from the kit that the church had bought. Uh, and, and I began to, to, to uh, uh, through my sermon, trying to maintain contact with all the congregation. So about three or four minutes in, I decided I'd look over here, over here to the second or third row where mother and dad always sat. And then I looked there and there was Jan holding onto my mother's hands just as tightly as my mother was holding on to Jan's hands. And I said, okay, I can't look back over there anymore. <laughs> As I say, the roof didn't fall in or anything like that. And, and I want you to notice that when I tell you about this first sermon in my home church, Epworth Church, Savannah, uh, I, I'm not telling you, I'm, I'm telling you all these personal details. I haven't told you a thing about the message that I attempted to proclaim that day. Luke is the opposite. Luke doesn't tell you anything of a personal nature. He doesn't tell you if his mother was proud of him. He doesn't tell you if Jesus' younger brothers misbehaved while he was up talking. He doesn't tell us if Jesus got a new pair of sandals for the occasion. None of that is, is in Luke's account. Everything he tells us is about the message that Jesus proclaimed. There are other accounts of Jesus' early preaching. Matthew and, and Mark have words very similar. 
to each other saying, and Jesus began to preach saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. As Luke tells it, and he, Luke is not telling us his chronologically first sermon because he had been teaching in the other synagogues, it says, but this is sort of like his inaugural message. This is Jesus setting the program, what he is about, going to be about. And really, I suggest that there are three levels of, uh, that we want to pay attention to this, to this reading. The first level is, what did it mean to Jesus? What did it mean for Jesus to proclaim this message? Now, I think that a National Football League team has 53 players on their roster for a game. At least that's how many San Francisco had when I looked up their roster last night uh, during, during their game. A major university may dress 100 or more players, at least I counted more than 100 on, on the Georgia roster for the national championship game. Every single one of these folks is a very talented athlete. Every single one of them has been selected for their role. Every one of them has been trained through years and years and years of instruction and practice. Every one of them wants to play well. Every one of them wants to win the game. But how are they going to win the game? In order for that to happen, the coach has to develop a game plan. I mean, they've got, yeah, look, look at your bulletin. You, you wondered how game plan was going to work into the sermon, right? Okay. They, they've got a, a playbook this big. They've got so many plays that they can run, but they've got to decide which plays will work best on that, in that game against those opponents. Which plays are they going to run? Which pass patterns, which rush uh, uh, blitz packages are, are they going to use? And let us not forget, Suppose the game comes down in the last minute of the fourth quarter to a two-point conversion. What's the very best play? They only get one chance to run it. What's the very best play that they can run? To some extent, Jesus is giving them his game plan. Of all the things that he might say, of all the things that he might do, what is he going to be about as a preacher of the gospel? That's such an important question. Years ago, uh, some, some years ago, during the time of a uh, presidential transition, it was a peaceful transition. We used to have those in this country. And, and uh, somebody wrote the, the, uh, about the job of the incoming administration. The United States is for peace in the world, but that doesn't tell the Secretary of State what to do when he gets up in the morning. Of all the things that you might do, what are you going to do? And it's important that you set out a program because it's dangerous to have a leader, be it in the political realm or the church or, or wherever, who's more interested in acquiring power than interested in what he wants to or she wants to do for the church, the congregation, the city, the nation, the state, or the world. Two weeks ago, we read the story of Jesus' baptism. And I think the meaning of the baptism was what it said to Jesus about who he was. In this lesson, Jesus, who has been told, you are my beloved son, tells the world what he intends to do. As I, I, I quoted those verses from uh, Mark and Matthew about his message, here Jesus has chosen a a, uh, a kingdom agenda. And he chooses Isaiah. Isaiah was a favorite passage of the, the Jewish community in, in that time, uh, as, as indeed it has been for the church throughout the centuries. There are more scrolls from Isaiah represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls than from anywhere, any comparable uh, part. So Jesus reads from, I believe it's the 58th and the 61st chapter, and the message is really simple. The message is God is at work. God is at work. To those who had begun to doubt whether God was active in the world, 
to those who were in pain and wondered if God had abandoned them and forgotten them. God is at work in the world and God is at work in your life. He talks about good news for the poor. For Luke, the word poor always has a literal meaning, not just spiritually poor, literally poor. But that's not the only meaning, it goes beyond that. The good news of God's activity in the world reaches out to those who are captive, to those who are blind, to those who are oppressed, to everyone who is looked down upon by the polite people of, of their society, to all those who think that they have been forgotten. This is the year of the Lord's favor, Jesus says to them. Fred Craddock suggests, thinks that maybe Jesus was thinking about the Jubilee year uh, of, the, of the Old Testament where all sorts of things, where debts were canceled and they, they had a, a Jubilee year, uh, like a, a reset of society. You, you know how when you've gotten your computer all messed up and you don't know what else to do, what do you do? You turn it off and you let it reset and you turn it back on and miracles happen uh, during, during that moment. We all wish we could hit a reset button and do some things over. Some of the people, some, some people in this world have more reason to wish that than others. Those who suffer neglect wish that they had been born into different circumstances. God is at work to redeem his people. God's son is now here on the scene to work for them as well. But he cannot do it all. Jesus healed many, many sick people, but not all of them. Jesus fed large numbers of hungry people, but not every hungry person. If you read the parables of the, of the wedding supper, when, when Jesus says that the king commands that, that everybody be brought in from the highways and the byways, bring in the lame, bring in the poor, those folks are still lame, they're still poor, but they are, at, they are guests at God's table. The people whom we live our lives trying to forget, God brings to the head table of the feast. Again, what did this passage mean to Luke? Luke is the evangelist who makes the announcement as Christy made the point in the, in the children's sermon. An evangelist is, is a, someone who tells the good news. And the good news is that this is God's son. The best news of all is that God has come near to us in the person of his son. And the church must always be telling that story. It will never be easy. The next verses that we are not reading today make that clear. Um, th this story kind of stops in the middle. You know how there's a point in a Shakespearean play where the, where the hero reaches uh, the apex of the story. Sometimes in a Broadway play at the end of the first act, everybody's happy and singing and, and all like this. And it's only when you come back after intermission that things start to, to go downhill to a crisis. It, this, this, this lesson is actually cut in the middle when everybody's still happy with Jesus. The next part is the one where they take him out as if to stone him. Some people tell the story of the career of Jesus as if there was this Galilean springtime where, where he went around the Galilean countryside and there were big crowds and everybody thought he was wonderful. There, there really wasn't that. We can see that he met opposition from the, from the very beginning. Luke says even his own hometown gave him fits. But Jesus didn't let that stop him. If his hometown was not going to be receptive, he went on to other villages. And the church throughout the centuries has learned the hard lesson that just because there is one person or one group of people who are resistant to the good news, that doesn't stop us. We go on to others because uh, the church never gives up over one hard case. This, and so the scripture is fulfilled over and over again. The final level, of course, is what did it mean 
what does it mean to us? And so let's start by considering this message about good news to the poor. Let's start with us with this question. How many poor people do you know? Are you good news to them? I confess there are very four, very few poor people whom I can call by their first name or who call me by their first name. Are, are we good news to, to them? Julia Ward Howe was the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She was an ardent abolitionist uh, and she worked closely with Senator uh, Charles Sumner, who was also an, a leader in the abolitionist movement. Julia Ward Howe contacted Sumner one day. There was somebody that she was trying to help out of a, of a difficult spot and she asked for his help in doing so. And he replied, my dear Julia, I am so busy leading the abolitionist movement that I do not have time to work with individual people. Julia Ward Howe said, that is remarkable, Charles. Even God hasn't reached that point yet. <laughs> How many poor people do we know can, whom we can call by name and in what ways are we good news to them? But there are other ways to follow Jesus, of course, not alone by one-on-one -on -one, uh, acts of caring, not alone people who don't have enough of this world's goods, who else do you know who feels left out? Who else do you know that perhaps feels forgotten by God? And what are you doing to change that? Who needs to sense God's love for them through Jesus? And what are you doing in order to show it? So this is what the scripture said. Jesus stood and read from the book of the prophet Isaiah these magnificent words that have been uh, handed down for centuries even before him. Then Jesus speaks for himself. And do you know what the first word that Luke gives us from the grown-up Jesus? The, the very first word that the grown-up Jesus speaks in Luke? Today. I hate that. All of us procrastinators hate that. We like someday, when convenient, when you, when you get around to it. Those are words that make us feel comfortable. Today? Now? Don't you hate those words? And yet the word today is one of Luke's favorites. He uses the word today more in his gospel than the other gospel writers use in all three of their gospels. It, it is today, the angels say to the shepherds, that the child is born to you in Bethlehem. It is today, Jesus says, when he calls Zacchaeus down out of the tree, today I will come to your house. And then after they spent some time at, at his house, it's today, he, and, Jesus, and Zacchaeus has responded, it's today, Jesus says, that salvation has come to this house, for this also is a son of Abraham. And carrying on later in the New Testament, it is today that Paul in 2 Corinthians says, today is the day of salvation. I'd rather it said something else because it's more convenient to say, someday I'll lose weight. Someday I'll read the Bible. Someday I'll pray regularly. Someday I'll start tithing. Someday I'll teach Sunday school. I'll get serious about Bible study. Someday I'll visit a nursing home or that lonely neighbor in, uh, across the street. Someday I might even invite them to church. Someday I won't avoid poor people driving carefully around those parts of town. I won't avoid, avoid poor people with problems. I'll find a way to, to help those problems. I used to read a lot of Bruce Larson. Bruce Larson I don't know where he ran across Scotty's uh, pub, but uh, he, he uh, would pass by Scotty's pub on a regular basis. And he remembered Scotty's pub because on the sign out at the, outside the door, Scotty's pub said, free beer tomorrow. He said, I passed that pub for six years. There never was any free beer because it was always free beer tomorrow. 
The first word that the grown-up Jesus says in Luke's gospel after reading the scripture was today. So what can help the oppressed go free? I love the story that uh, Tony Campolo tells that he got from Bill Clinton. Clinton said, met Nelson Mandela, I'm guessing maybe in the White House. Clinton said to Mandela, I watched you the night that they let you out of prison. He said, it was three o'clock in the morning here, but I had my daughter get up out of bed to come with me and watch you be released from prison. I watched you walk across the courtyard. They zeroed in on your, they, they focused in on your face. And what I saw was an angry, embittered man. And Clinton said, that's not the man I've come to know today. Mandela said, Mr. President, it's interesting that you saw me the day that I got out of prison. Because on that day, I was angry. I was embittered. And all I could think of was they have taken everything from me. They have taken the better part of my life. My family is gone. Everything, that my movement is gone. Everything has been taken from me. And he said, and I hated them. And then Mandela said, God spoke to me and said, Nelson, for 27 years, you were their prisoner. But in your heart and your soul, you were a free man. Don't let them make you a free man today and keep you as their prisoner. And that was the word from God that changed Nelson Mandela from an embittered victim to a diplomat and statesman of the world. God can change people. God is at work to make a difference in people's lives. People can be set free through Jesus. We can help. We can help today. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, creator of the heavens and of the earth, who art in all and above all, who knowest every star and meteor in a million galaxies, who lovest every plant and animal and person, who gives us the law and the prophets, the gospel and the epistles, who sendest Jesus, the word made flesh. We thank thee for the opportunity and the invitation to hear and be inspired by thy sacred word today. As the scrolls are opened and your words are read and preached, plant them deep in our souls that they might transform us and propel us to be thy agents and ambassadors today. Make us hunger and thirst for righteousness today. Make us to seek thy kingdom first today. Make us to want nothing more today than to live and love and serve as thou would have us do. 
Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We thy creatures, sheep of thy flock, the work of thy hands, submit ourselves to thee again today. Now hear us as we pray and as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My hope is that as we finish this service that each of us will take stock in our lives of how we can be agents of God in bringing Christ's love and power into the world. If that should include a decision to unite with the membership of this church, I invite you to join Creed and me at the front as we sing the concluding hymn.
Go forth to love and to serve God in all that you do. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Amen.